Get a drink, make yourselves comfortable. We're, we're about to start. Does it sound good? Can you hear? Sounds good. Sorry, were you saying something? What? No, it wasn't. No, nothing useful. Is that right? Sound good? Let me test this one. Hello, hello, hello. That one's better. It's better. Why is that one? Why is that one? It makes you sound like... American. Yeah. Hey, dude, then. Louis Armstrong. Okay, so welcome, welcome. Who, who's been to Web Wednesday before? That's the first time. A lot of you are virgins. Web Wednesday virgins. Who's a Web Wednesday virgin? Nice. Who is here because they like moustaches? One of you. Who is going to sponsor me because I'm growing a moustache? Yeah, yeah. Go to mopro.co slash Napoleon Beats. And it's very funny because um, this is a charity that was started by a man. And the idea is you grow hair on your face in order to make people think about your balls and your bum. So only a man can come up with an idea like that. So let's start. We're gonna have, we're gonna have, um, let's start with, where is Martin? Martin is going to tell you a very interesting uh, community that's starting in Hong Kong. In, in the startup world, people tend to talk about... Where is it? Microphone. People tend to talk about how good they are, and how they've raised lots of money, and how brilliant their idea is, but nobody shares uh, their failures. So, Martin is here to tell you about his failures. As you can tell, he's got a t-shirt to illustrate it. Well, exactly. Uh, turn on. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Um, so, basically, I'm Martin. I'm the founder and former CEO of Fonjo. I don't know if you've heard about it. Um, anyways, um, I started three years ago. What is Fonjo? Fonjo is a mobile game controller that turns your smartphone into a console. So that's like physical buttons, like an Xbox controller just to your iPhone or Android phone. So you can play like core games on your smartphone. Did you make money? Uh, we make money, still making money. Um, so you didn't fail. But yes and no, I'd say. So it's it's always a mix between failure and success, right? Um, so let me tell you why I'm hosting this conference. It's called Postmodern HK, and it's a conference about startup failure. Um, it's on on the next Saturday, on the 22nd of November. Are you doing it in the graveyard or? Uh, kind kind of, of it's called Cyberport. Cyberport. <laughs> <laughs> Good joke. That's probably the money every year, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So, that's the place you go, and that's where the elephants of the internet go, right? Cyberport. Exactly, exactly. So the reason why I'm hosting it is because when I was a first time founder, I did a bunch of mistakes. And I was pretty embarrassed about it. I felt, felt kind of shitty about myself. Like, how come I make all these mistakes because I was trying to do all these new things that I had no idea about? And then, you know, um, you know, I talked to other founders, and it turned out that all of them they were doing like the same kind of mistakes. And I was wondering, why is nobody talking about this? Because like, if somebody would have told me this and that, I would have learned about it. So let's just take a quick survey. How many people in this room have made a mistake? <laughs> None of the girls put their hands up. You know. How many of them have made a mistake in a startup? How many have fucked up in a startup? I lost other people's money. How many have lost their own money? <laughs> and then keep it up. Thank you for coming. Exactly. Point proof. Um, so, anyways, it's a one-day event. We have entrepreneurs. We got investors. We even got a journalist coming to talk about their failures. And it doesn't have to be a lethal failure. You know, like obviously you make a mistake and you learn from it, and then it turns out to become a big success. And that is really what Postmodern HK is all about: turning failure into success. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to get a ticket, just go to postmodern.hk and you can get a ticket right there. So, um, Hong Kong is not a culture about talking about failure. Exactly. It's, not Silicon, it's a big issue in Hong Kong. It's not Silicon Valley, right? I mean, in Silicon Valley, yeah. you wear it on your t-shirt. So, how are you going to get around that cultural difference in Hong Kong? Well, you know, there's always, you know, Somebody has to try first, so I have no idea how it will turn out. Obviously, there's no reservations for the figure. 
um, some founders actually came to me and said, I don't want to speak at this conference because you know I don't want to be a player in failure. So that is a very true. So there's going to be lots of you know, Kuwaiti talking to Kuwaiti. Um, not necessarily. We even have like some Hong Kong investors. We have. Um, I think we do have two founders from Hong Kong as well. So at the end of the day, you'll be it's okay to fail. Right? Exactly. Nice. Good job. Right, round of applause. So go to postmortem.hk, right? Yeah. I go through stickers, like you mind if I have stickers? Yeah, he's got stickers. Where are the stickers? No, I got them in my bag. I can just leave them yeah. on the tables if you don't mind. Does it say, uh, I, I failed, ask me how? No one actually says, I, 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 I the best way. way to learn is from other mistakes. Nice. Right. Thanks. Good job. Thank you. All right, and today we actually have a sponsor. You see, you see these things. If you're a man, you will appreciate this. This is a wallet that shrinks your wallets. Right? Um, Malcolm, where are you? Come and say a few words about this. This is a startup. Now, let me remind you, this, this event is part of uh, Start Me Up Week in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, Invest Hong Kong has finally woken up and said we're going to support the startup community. So what I like about Malcolm is this has got nothing to do with digital technology. So Malcolm's going to tell you a few words about what this is. Okay, um, thanks very much, Tony. Um, I've been roaming around Asia for the last 20 years. Excuse me, excuse me! Shh! How do you hear me? Polite, please. Oh, you. Stephanie. So, 20 years... Pass through. You, man. A friend. I've been roaming around Asia for 20 years with a massive wallet in my pocket. And uh, I felt it was about time to uh, slim down. So on a long train journey, I sewed it together at first what turned out to be skin water. And it worked quite well. Uh, that was a couple of years back. Um, I then decided to take it to the next stage, get it produced. And uh, what we have is the skin water. The, the idea of it is simply to be able to come to a function like this without your trousers falling down uh, and without having to put your loose cash in your pocket and then putting it through the washing machine. You can fit, well, as you can have a competition, see how many cars you can fit in, but certainly fit one person in this room that's going to challenge that Nikola, right? Try, Nikola. try and get as many as you can in there. But Nikola, is, he's the networker of Hong Kong. Where are you, Nikola? I had a chat with him earlier. Certainly 50 he goes into a room, cars. he meets everybody, and he collects all cars within five minutes. He's like, <laughs> he's got my He's the master. Yeah, he's got my if you can use one of your wallets, you've sold it. So, very flexible. From a couple of cars and your cash when you're out uh, at a party or sport or whatever, or you can squeeze in 10, 15, 20 cars and lots of cash. So, we're just launching. Uh, we're into a few outlets in Hong Kong now. Uh, great to be here. I'd love to get some feedback from you all on the product. You see some of the wallets on the side here on the right. Uh, How much does the wallet cost? Retail is $195 Hong Kong, $25 US. But tonight, tonight only. special, because I don't carry change anymore, it's $150. Well, what do you do with those $5 coins? I give them away to charities. People who yeah. just touch this. <laughs> So I want to ask you, as you're on stage, why, why do you want to make something so concrete when we live in such a digital world? Because all this talk about mobile wallets, and you've made one out of, out of material. Well, the ca cash doesn't quite go away. Um, what, Octopus? Octopus is in there. A big company called Apple. Apple? It's quite a large company called Alibaba. I think generally, hands up everyone who's got some sort of note cash in their pocket. In fact, can I ask people if they can put their hands on their wallets and just hold it up? Hold up your wallet. Who's got the fattest wallet? The biggest fattest wallet. Right, right. Well, I'm going to be able to do some work. That's a handful of cash count as well. Yeah, no. There's a handful of cash there. All right, yeah, cash. She's got a credit card. There's plenty of notes around. Okay, notes. Uh, Hong Kong is a great place for octopus. So what are you doing? How are you using the internet to promote your product? You've got a Facebook page, right? We've got, we've got a Facebook page. Honestly, are people like it? What, what, what are you doing? How are people? Not, not enough yet, and no, that's no. why I'm here tonight. So I ne desperately need your So help. if I like your page, will you give me a wallet? <laughs> if, if you... Blackmail. The internet's all about blackmail. What are you going to give me? Take a picture of your enormous wallet or your pile of money. Put it on uh, our 
Facebook page. What is the address of your Facebook page? Wallet. Skin at wallet. Skin Wallet. Posted it at Skin Wallet. Like our page. And the five most heavy or impressive wallets will get a free Skin Wallet. Nice. How about that? Right. Good job. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you. So Malcolm is sponsoring some prizes tonight, so if you stay in your good audience, you ask good questions, and you keep quiet out of respect to the speaker, we're going to do a lucky draw, right? Very old fashioned. So you're all here to pick up your skin wallet, and hear from Steve, where are you Steve? The only man in this room wearing a t-shirt, apart from Martin. Stephen, where are you? Oh, come here, come to the stage. Let's have a little warm round of applause for Stephen, please. Excellent, right. You get to sit down. Have you got a drink? Has everybody got a drink? No? Who in this room, before we start, is in the travel industry? Who is here because you want to spy? One of you in the back, right? Yeah, he's spying, okay. Um, hello. <laughs> So Stephen and I met at a travel industry event called Eye for Travel, and I was quite impressed. Um, I wanted to ask you, can you take your jacket off? I've got a moustache, I'm allowed to say that. Take your jacket off. There you go, man. Why is your company called Your BB? Because there's a, apparently when I, I did search for Your BB and all that came up was Arabic love sites. <laughs> Habibi means my darling in Arabic. And then you learn something new, right? Yeah, Habibi is down the road here and it's, it's about love. Hello? Um, so it's called, uh, called Yobibi because in Chinese, um, Yuyo means travel and Bibi means to compare. And so the, the idea was just compare travel. And, uh, we're that must have taken a lot of thinking. Were you, were you stoned one night, or were you had too many beers and change it? Or was it like, oh, your BB? It was like the the cheapest, uh, you know, sort of available domain name that you could afford at the time. It wasn't squatted. It wasn't squatted, and uh, so it cost about you know ten dollars. So where are you from? Because you don't sound very Hong Kong. You, where are you from? I'm from Singapore. But I'm you don't sound very Singapore either. Spent uh, a long. Actually, more, more of my life outside of Singapore. So, you know, this week in Hong Kong is all about startups coming to Hong Kong. Why did you decide to start your business in Hong Kong if you're from Singapore and you have an English accent? I was working here. Um, so you had a real job? A real job. Did you fail? In, in my job? Yeah. Ish, yeah. yeah you get fired. I was in finance. Oh, right. It was 2009. Okay, yeah. Things happened. Okay. Um, and I, yeah, and, you know, there was a, a girl I liked at the time, who's now wife, so I thought I'd stay here. Congratulations. Yeah. Nice. So, you, you're in Hong Kong. Why, why did you want to do something in the travel space? I mean, if you, if you had to choose all of the industries that are going to the internet, you know, travel is highly competitive. And I mean, when you started this, just tell us, what, what does YoBB do? Well, what, why would you want to be in that space? Yeah, so well, what's known in the, in, the, in the online travel space is a meta search uh, company, which means that we compare, we aggregate and compare lots and lots of different sellers of travel products. So we're one step beyond Expedia or, or C-Trip or Priceline. Who, they, they compare hotels, they compare flights, and you go there, but they've got inventory, they're selling you the product. What we are, meta search companies are platforms. We aggregate, we don't have our own inventory, we aggregate Prices and inventory from, from lots and lots of people who want to sell it to the consumer. So, yeah, no, but you started that in Hong Kong, right? And, and when you started it, there was Kayak, there was Chunar, right, the Chinese website, with a camel. So, why, why would you want to start your VP? And you, what, what do you think is different from, you know, Kayak and Chunar and all these guys? They're meta search engines, right? Yeah. So, Kayak wasn't in China, still isn't. Really, um, and so in the, in the whole vast market that was that it was and is China, uh, we, you know, excuse me, Shh. out of respect for the speaker, some people behind you want to hear. So, sorry, I have to go. The whole vast market that was and is China for, for travel, and we can see that travel is going to grow as it has 
there was really only tuna as a major player, and they weren't even that big then. They hadn't been more when you say then, you're talking about when? Um, well, we started researching it. It was four and a half years ago. Okay. Yeah. So you started, you said this is a good space, I'm going to start a, a business. Why did you start it in Hong Kong? Well, I was apart here. from being married. I wasn't married then. Okay. Um, I, I was here, um, I like Hong Kong, and I, I decided that the business that I wanted to do was going to be focused on China. Okay. So it made a lot of sense to be in Hong Kong because um, Hong Kong's part of China and it's right next to mainland China. And so it ended up that we set up our office in Shenzhen, which is just North Hong Kong. So when I've spoken to you before, you said all of the startups in Hong Kong miss out on something, which is having engineers in Shenzhen. So can you expand upon this? Because in Hong Kong, if you're looking for the biggest problem is resources, right? Finding good programmers, developers, designers. Do you think the answer is Shenzhen? Or Cyberport? Or Science Park? An answer is, is potentially Shenzhen. Shenzhen's got 15 million people, more than double Hong Kong. Tencent is there, Huawei is there, ZTE is there. You know, lots of tech companies, lots of tech talent. So I think it's something anyone you know, from Hong Kong should consider. So you go down. Where did you start your business? Was it in a co-location space? Were they around when you started? They didn't exist, right? So you sat in your bedroom. You go right. Your BB got the domain. What do I do now? Yeah, I got up every morning and went to the dining table and I, I said, okay, this is when work starts. It's like ten thirty or something. I used to start the work day and uh, started planning it. And then um, when things got you know a bit more serious, incorporated a company. Went to China, incorporated a company in Shenzhen. Um, Found, you know, started hiring some people in Shenzhen and then from there. But the the meta search business, what is the core of the meta search business? Is it algorithms? Is it mathematics? I mean, what makes a good meta search engine? It's the availability of a lot of real time data, travel, you know, pricing and availability primarily of flights and hotels and potentially other products. But a lot of consumers don't realise that how complex something like a flight. You know, you just think, oh, it's easy, I go to the site and, and it's like a stock market, there's a fixed price. That's not the case at all. Like, you know, the, the, every single second the availability is changing and there's different fare classes and everyone, you know, there's wholesale and retail prices and, 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 and all of those are being adjusted all the time. So, so is, is it like a central market, market you get this from? Is there, is, there a, is there a kind of secret internet that you go to for data about travel? Or is it just... Is it you get APIs from lots of different companies? How does it work? Is it is it like banking? Is it like kind of secret handshakes or, or? It's more than that. It's more APIs and getting building a back end and getting offline people who sometimes have the best prices to enter their pricing policies into your back end, which you which you combine with a centralized feed from something called a global distribution system, which is a, you know like Amadeus or in China Travel Sky. And so they give you a sort of a base price, which is kind of like LIBOR. And then you get someone to come and say, yeah, I'll add 20 bucks to that. That's the price I'll set that ticket at. And it's a so is, there, is there a similarity between banking and the travel industry? You think in, terms of in some ways, I, I feel like it's a very over-the-counter market. Um, I feel like the bond market sometimes. That doesn't mean anything to me, over-the-counter bond market. Can you explain? Yeah. So it's just it's a, it's a lot of private deals. So as opposed to sort of when you want to buy something, a product, you go to someone who's willing to sell it to you, and the price they're willing to sell it to you at that moment of time depends on where they bought it or whether they even have it. They might be just be like, oh, they might be like, you want to buy it from me, so I'll go and buy it from someone else now. Okay, so that's all about timing. Yeah. So, so you started from here and then Shenzhen. Did you go to angel investors and, and funds, or did you? How did you start a business like that? Because it requires technology, right? It requires technology, but it's largely the good thing about platform type business as opposed to uh, uh, you know sort of an inventory type business is you don't need a big sales force, you don't need um, you need an office, you need a bunch of, of, of developers, and, and so it's largely technology, but you don't need a lot of capital to to go and do sales and buy inventory and stuff like that. So you just to hire some people and, and start start developing. But then, how do people discover you? Because the end buyer is, is a consumer; it's not a business. So how do you, you've got to spend a lot of money getting known, because in China, if you want to get on travel, you go to what, Sea Trip, Yilong, Alibaba, Chunar. Yeah. How do you get on people's radar? That's the challenge. It's, it's difficult for any consumer facing B2C business, I think, not just in travel, uh, if you don't have a massive amount of money to burn. And we didn't, and we never had. So we just built organically through 
social, through, through a targeted digital acquisition, um, through you know, some guerrilla marketing tactics, um, just various things. And we never had, just to be blunt, we never had a massive user base. We had hundreds of thousands rather than millions or tens of millions of users. So what did you find worked best for you? Was it you know, people handing out leaflets at the train station? Was it keywords on Baidu? You tried that. Was it you know going nuts on Weibo? Was it what, tried that. Was it buying banner ads on, on you know websites? What was the most effective way to generate users? Well, effective is difficult. I mean, you look at pure ROI. You could rank stuff like that. Yeah. But we, you could just say, I don't really care about ROI, and I'm gonna go longer term, right? For for us, I mean, we were very cost conscious. We tried stuff. You did this with your own money. Yes. Uh, we tried stuff like you know, we put in um, when Weibo had a, a function where people could check in, you know, like yeah. uh, all those check-in type websites. So we, we we used their interface to find everyone who checked in to a hotel, check in, not, not literally checking the hotel, like checked in to say I'm now at this hotel yeah. in China. And we're like, oh, this is a great opportunity. We'll send them a message then, at them, and say, you know, we can you should, look, we can get you this hotel cheaper. And we found that a lot of people who checked in to hotels were like, you know, like um, uh, sort of prostitutes and, and <laughs> like not people. And they get they get a free hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> They're like sitting around the lobby and, and like. Oh, so we tried lots of different things, but um, you know, SEM is effective if, if, if you do it well, and, and we learned a lot about it. SEO. So you were using Baidu. Baidu primarily. We tried, you know, we tried Sogo and, and see what we could do. Yeah. And uh, SEO is, is important, so we get we get not inconsiderable organic traffic. So that's worth. Why is that? Are you are you doing lots of content? Philip is here talking. Phil, where are you, man? There's a few content people in this room saying it's all about content, right? So how does Yobi B make content that appears on our SEO? Yeah. So for us, we're not we're not so much a content site, right? We're a product site, but it's more like we have pages which are really purely SEO pages, page rank type pages, like what's every lists? single flight like lists. Every single flight route, every single hotel, um, from you know, from from some obscure city in China to get from here to to some other obscure place, you have that. And it'd be very long tail, but you get traffic from that. So, do you believe in lists? I think the internet has become a lists. Five top places to go for romance. Ten top places to take your children. Three top places to have sex. Whatever, right? I mean, it's kind of Buzzfeed. Yeah, yeah, Buzzfeed. So, did you get into that game? Was it all about lists? Absolutely killing it. Um, I not not so much for us. I mean, we just approach SEO as like a technical problem. For, I, I think it's a very technical thing. I mean, content is if you're a content-focused product, I mean, content is important. But for us, it was it was a very very it was quite um, it was almost like a, just a data-driven thing. What keywords work and what don't. So two years ago, I interviewed uh, one of the founders of Tunar at Web Wednesday, Fritz. Yeah. You know, Fritz Tomoflas. He was saying it was all about algorithms, and the, the, the second, the difference in price that you know somebody would offer you between C Trip and Elon, it's like arbitrage, because basically in China what happens is somebody advertises one price, and they bait and switch and give you another price. So how do you get around that whole kind of bait and switch business in hotels and airlines? It's a problem for, for, for better search engines. A lot of the trust the consumer has in you is that you're giving them the right price. So they get, they get paid off when you, when they re you re redirect them to, to somewhere that's off, not offering you that price. Often you will attempt to contract with that partner to say that if that does happen, there, there's a penalty yeah. or they'll compensate you somehow. Um, another way that people are trying to do it now is increasingly we're trying to push bookings onto our own site or app such that you don't get redirected. So, for example, you come to your BB or Skyscanner, you find a you know, uh, Cathay Pacific flight, and rather than jump to Cathay Pacific website, you just book it in app. But you'll be told Cathay Pacific is selling you this flight within Skyscanner. Okay. So, so, but then is the payment done through your system? You collect all the data. And the travel industry, isn't it? Also, aren't they very super conscious about well, who owns the end customer? Is it you know? Is it you? Is it Cafe Pacific? Is it you yes. know, Shangri La? It's a really good question. I think for the meta search players, we, we like to say that we're facilitating, we're assisting, and booking. So it's it's the cus the customer is the person, the seller, the retailer is the person who's selling the product, Cafe Pacific, in my example, and it's not our customer. We're just making it easier for that person to book and buy what he wants to buy. 
and we'll pass the money on to you and make it seamless. Yeah, but if they book on your website, you've got my details, right? Correct, but, well, you know, that's... Yeah. You book on Cathay Pacific, they've got your details. So if Cathay, if Cathay Pacific if the one that consumers details will say, yes, yeah. well, that, that's your customer, you can put them up to your loyalty program, etc. So you were doing this for how long before you needed to go and ask for money from somebody? How quickly did you break even? We got to the point at about two, somewhere between the second and third year. And the good thing about the meta search model is that once you, at the beginning, nobody knows who you are, and so you, you're scraping people. And then after a while, you get some traffic and you bring. Wait, 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 hold it. Scraping people. It, well, that sounds rather dodgy. Is that happens in Shenzhen? <laughs> When I've been scraped in Shenzhen, they usually come back with a ball of skin and they say, wow, what's honey that they, and they've got like an old skin, dead skin, right? That's what I call scraping. Yeah, so in this context, <laughs> scraping, more like... <laughs> he appreciates that. If you had Tabe, you know what I'm talking about, right? Have you had Tabe? Yeah, which means all the... Where an old bloke, like, no, 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 he takes, he takes, he scrubs all the dead skin off you and turns it into a golf ball. Yeah. yeah anyway, let's not go that way. Go back to what you're talking about. So scraping in this context is more like, um, it's like what search engines do. It's, it's sending out bots and, um, and crawling. So you were saying in the early days you were sending out bots? Yeah. And you were nicking content on other people's websites? Just taking prices which were publicly available. Nicking. Borrowing. Yeah. Right. This is a, this is a, so that gets, you, that gets you in front of people, right? Is that how it works? Yeah, so that, that gives you a product. And then you can go to the people who you are now bringing customers to and say, look, yesterday I got you a hundred, I got you a thousand users of which I'm pretty sure a hundred actually bought, bought something from you. And why do you work with me? So you say, right, I brought you a hundred people, you pay me a commission on those, right? So it's an affiliate model, right? You're basically you refer business to other people. Most of them are CBC, so that you refer them and they pay per click. That's per click, not per, per, per booking? Per booking. Both. Okay. Yeah. So you can do that and break even within two years? And truth be told, we never actually broke even. Okay. We're making revenue, we were getting to like a pretty low burn, and so yeah. we, we can, which kept us going to where we didn't have to raise capital um, you know, urgently. But we got to the point where, um, after about three years, we realized that to, to go big, we'd have to raise capital. So how come uh, you know Baidu or Alibaba or Tencent didn't approach you and say, "I'll have some of that"? It seems to be the story in China, right? If you're a successful internet startup, they're like, "Go to go, I'll buy you or I'll copy you." Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Ask them. Um, it could have happened maybe in time, but I think maybe what we had had more value to an international player in terms of the, we, the domestic kind of uh, user base and technology and the uh, customer relationships um, that we had and the licensing, etc., and, and the team and the product, um, you know, maybe, maybe we're, we're more valuable to... So tell us a little bit about how you mean, because you're dealing, are you dealing only with Chinese travelers? Yes. Only within China, or are you doing, you know, cross-border stuff as well? Our target market was Chinese people from mainland China who want to travel anywhere, either domestically or outbound. Okay, so what, did you see any strange trends? I mean, I know Hong Kong benefits from, what was it, last year, 40 million tourists came here, right? So are you seeing interesting trends? I know that Obama, and you were saying, right, Obama and Xi Jinping have just closed a deal on going to America or something. Yeah, so for outbound, uh, Hong, Hong Kong and Macau get collectively about 35 to 40 million domestic you know, Chinese people coming here each year. Somewhere like the next couple popular ones are Thailand, Taiwan, which have maybe five million, yeah. South Korea, uh, Singapore, all in that range. And then the US is at about number 10 or so last year with two million. Okay. So I mean, for outbound destinations, most of the top 10 is still Asian, and Hong Kong Macau is, is, has been the top two for a long time. So why didn't you sell your business to Kayak or Expedia or somebody? Did they approach you? We, we spoke to, to some of those people. To some of those people. Yeah. So let, let, explain to me how, so you, you've got a business that's going, it's kind of not really breaking even, and then um, you, how do you start winning people over from C-Trip and Elon and all these guys? Is, is that, was that really a target? Do you go and say, these are big Chinese operators, we need to go out there and move faster, we need to be more nimble? We need to have better customer service. What, what is the trick? 
we can almost always beat them on price um, because Secret has got great customer service and they're a, they're a client of ours. They list their products on our platform. But we also list lots of other small, scrappy agents who are willing to undercut them, basically.